Six circles of relationship formed around Jesus in his time on earth. In the outermost circle, there were the crowds, tens of thousands of people curious to learn more about the prophet from Galilee. Next, the 5,000 who journeyed out from their villages in desperate need of something from Jesus. Then the 70 who served Jesus' ministry. They wanted to do something for him. There were the 12 who Jesus called to leave their jobs and the worlds they knew to follow him. Then Peter, James, and John, who fully embraced the joy of Jesus as well as his sufferings. And finally, the one, John, who sat beside him at the Last Supper. He listened more closely than any other and recognized the Savior when no one else did. What can we learn from these circles of relationship about how we can get closer to Jesus today? Jesus is always calling you closer. I'm excited because today we're kicking off a brand new series, and it's called uh, The One Jesus Loves. The One Jesus Loves. And to kind of give you a snapshot of, of this series, a, a great friend of Brittany and I's um, who was living in Lakeland, Florida. They're actually moving to Ohio uh, to be the, the, the president and CEO of Emerge Ministries, which if you've been a part of the Assemblies of God uh, ever in your life, you've probably heard of Emerge, and it's a great, great resource. And, and they are serving as a counseling center and for pastors or families, whatever. And, and Dr. Robert Christ, Crosby uh, is, is serving as the president there. He'll actually be with us in just a few weeks. But he wrote a book called The One Jesus Loves. And so we have a few copies available out at the Sisterhood table for $10. It's our cost. Um, and we would love for you to buy that book, journey with, that, with us through this book. Um, and if we sell out, just go ahead and pre-order and we'll have you a copy next week. Um, but I found it fitting that this would be the series that carries us out of Easter. Because a lot of times in, in, in the church world, we build up to Easter Sunday. And it's like um, I leaned over to Brittany this morning and I said, I'm glad we don't base our success on Easter and our failure on the Sunday after. Uh, because it seems like even Pastor Jimmy chose to take vacation uh, this Sunday. If you're watching live from Ireland, um, I'm taking vacation next year this time. So um, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, but everything builds up to Easter. We put so much pressure on Easter. But church still happens the week after. Life still happens the week after. How many know, like, your week this week probably wasn't as great as Easter Sunday was for you, you know? It's just the reality of where we are. And we're going to take the next seven weeks, because Mother's Day is kind of in between. And I, I told Brittany, I said, I won't make you preach in our series for Mother's Day. So she's going to be, I'm just revealing a little bit that Brittany's going to preach on Mother's Day. And I'm excited about that. Um, yes, she's, she's my better half, for sure. Um, but we're going to take six weeks, and we're going to journey through these circles. And there are six circles of relationship that we find in Scripture. And it starts with the crowds. If you look at the story of Jesus, if you look through the Gospels, the narrative that's there, you see that there were crowds that gathered around Jesus everywhere he went. And, the, and, and, and these crowds, and what we're going to talk about today, this is the place of watching and listening. This is the relationship of just watching and listening. But then we see that there was a more intimate crowd. And the next layer, the next circle, is the 5,000. And this is a place where feeding takes place and healing takes place. And then we have another circle that's the 70 or 72, depending on which translation you're working with there. And this is the place of working and serving. And then we gain a little closer and we find the 12, which is a place of leaving it all and following Jesus. And then we gather to the three, which is a place of joy and suffering. And then we gather to the one, which is a place of sacrificial love. Now, if you've read through the Gospels, you know that the one would actually be John. And John is known as the one Jesus loved. Now, here's the interesting thing. John actually uh, gave himself that title. Uh, and so, <laughs> you know, I wonder if Peter was writing, you know, the story. Would Peter say, well, I'm the one he loves? Um, but anyways, John, John has kind of given himself uh, this title. But our goal through this series is that we would move closer to Jesus. 
regardless of where we are, regardless of what circle, you may have already said, well, I'm probably at circle number four today, you know? Maybe you're at circle number six. Regardless of where you are in the circle, Jesus loves you where you are, but his intent is not for you to stay there. You may be in the three... You may say, Pastor, I'm in this place of joy and suffering. I've left it all behind. I'm following Jesus. But Jesus did not desire for you to stay there. He wants you to move to this place of sacrificial love. For all of us, our goal, our journey of following Jesus should be moving us closer to where he is. So this series, if you had to give kind of a a snapshot, a, a descriptive, we're going to be talking about intimacy with Jesus. Now, some of you, the moment I say that word intimacy, if you're a guy in the room, you're like, can I just go fishing? Can we like go read some sports clips or whatever right now? Because I'm going to disconnect from this series. But let me tell you that the, 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 the connection point for intimacy really just means friendship, relationship. For all of us, it is our goal. It should be our goal. When we say, yes, I want to follow Jesus, regardless of what circle we're at, we should pursue intimacy with him, relationship with him. We should be moving from a circle into a closer circle. See, I believe this, that followers of Jesus have to refuse to follow at a distance. If you're not moving closer, you're moving further away. I remember hearing that statement so many times growing up that you can't stand still with Jesus. You're either drawing closer or you're moving further away. And some people may say, well, I'm comfortable with standing still. Well, the problem is if we try and stand still, we're actually not scientifically, we're not standing still right now because we're on an earth that's constantly spinning and our life is constantly spinning and moving and revolving around us. And so there is no such thing as trying to just stand still with Jesus. We've got to get in this pattern to say, hey, God, I, I, I want to move closer to you. I want to have a, a, a more intimate relationship with you. And the closer we move to Jesus, the more we begin to look like him, sound like him, behave like him, think like him. I remember reading one time that the University of Michigan, go Wolverines, right? Justin sitting on the front row representing, he loves Michigan. Uh, But the University of Michigan did this study on married couples. And maybe you've heard of this, maybe you read the same article. But married couples who've been married for over 25 years, how many, how many married couples you've been married more than 25 years? If you're proud of it, you can raise your hand. There we go. The happier you are in your marriage of 25 plus years, the more you look like your spouse. Now, who wants to raise their hand again? You know? <laughs> the, the happier you are in that relationship, the more you begin to take on the characteristics of the one you're in relationship with. Now, I don't believe that that's just true of marriage. I believe that's true of our relationship with Jesus. The more we embrace, the the more we embrace the fulfillment of who he is and who he created us to be, the more we should begin to look like him, think like him, act like him, talk like him. It's this whole idea of us drawing closer to Jesus. Oswald Sanders said this, we are as close to Christ as we choose to be. See, I think for a lot of us, we want to place our our distance or our nearness to Christ based on the circumstances of events around us, where we are in life. But the truth is, we choose how close we are to Christ. We may think, and and, and in our new believers class, Fresh Start, we just talked about this, that some of the false tenses and the the false understandings of Jesus is that sometimes we believe that he's a distant God, but he's actually a near God, which means that we choose how much we really let him in our life. We could all stand up here. I, I, I can promise there's areas of my life that I struggle to give to Jesus. There are probably... And I know there are areas of your life that you struggle to give to him. Why? Because we are fleshly beings. We are, we are in this world. We are born into a life of sin. And so there is this constant struggle between our spirit and our flesh. 
And so we have to make the choice, how much are we really going to let Jesus into our life? How close will we really be? What circle do I really want to find myself in? And am I choosing to move closer? See, the crowd is a place of watching and listening. And we find there's a lot of, of, of crowd context in Scripture. And I'm just going to read a few for you uh, this morning where we see that the crowds are gathering around Jesus. And the first is in Mark 1, 32 through 33. And you may not have all those scriptures back there, and if you don't, it's okay. 32 says this, That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door. We're going to come back and just talk about what that would have meant in, in, in those days. Mark 1.45, instead he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet this, still, the people came to him from everywhere. Mark 3, verse 8, when they heard about all he was doing, many, came, many people came to him from Judea, Jerusalem, and regions across the Jordan. And, and all around, these people began to draw to Jesus in the crowds. People were coming from everywhere to see and to hear what Jesus was doing and had to say. Do you realize that there are still crowds that are gathering to see and hear what Jesus has to say? Last week was proof. Why, why does attendance spike at Easter? Why is it four times more likely for somebody to say yes to come to church on Easter? Because there's still this idea, there's still this, this culture of the crowd where we like to, to gather. We want to see and hear what Jesus has to say. See, Jesus loved the crowds. Jesus absolutely loved the crowds, and we're going to get into that a little bit today, but he didn't want you to stay in the crowd. He desires for you to move closer. See, there's so many different types of people in crowds. Even this morning, there are different types of people. Some of you have a, 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 a context of church. You grew up in church your whole life. Some of you may have, have received Christ and stepped into a church at, later in life. Some of you have been burned by the church, hurt by the church. Some of you have just started coming to church, and this is all brand new. Maybe today is your first day stepping in church in a long time. There's a lot of us that carry different amounts of pain and, and hurt and sickness and brokenness. And in the crowds, it's all represented. Every walk of life, every struggle, every sin is represented in the crowd. There's so many different types of people in the crowd. That's why the crowd can be a place of comfort for a lot of us. Now, I want to just, just before we kind of get in, this, this is kind of the precursor to the message. Really could have probably been two messages this morning, but I'll, I'll, I'll keep it going quickly. See, in Mark 1, 32 and 33, it said that evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. See, I believe this. If we're going to have crowds, we have to have people who bring the crowds. We have to have bringers. It should be more than just Easter Sunday we invite people to join us. Amen. Notice scripture doesn't say, hey, we need inviters, we need bringers. Sometimes I believe that we have to shift our mindset a little bit. And, and we have, if you exit out the back every Sunday, there's, there's a sign that you see coming in that says, welcome home. And on the way back out, it says, life change begins with an invitation. And an invitation is a great first step, but sometimes we need to go a step further and be a bringer. Some of us know what it's like to be brought to church, maybe by your mom and dad. You didn't have an option. Mom and dad, we're bringing you to church every week. You're sick? It's okay, we're going to bring you. There's healing in the house of the Lord, you know. You're tired? Scripture says come if you're tired and weary and find rest in the presence of the Lord. You know, there's a scripture for every excuse you had in the book. How come we let our friends and our relatives and our families off the hook so easy? We invite one time, they tell us no, and we stop. 
Yet how many sick and broken and demon-possessed? Don't raise your hand on that one. (laughs) Are we surrounded by every single week? And we have the opportunity to be bringers, to bring them to this place, into the crowds, to see and hear that the Lord is good. The Lord is faithful. The Lord is still moving in our church and in this city and in our lives. But we have to make the choice. Will we be bringers? Last week, I was so encouraged by uh, one of our, 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 the people in, in the church. And I got a text message. Pastor Jimmy and I did like two days before Easter. And it was a screenshot of a text message conversation of them inviting other people. And they got a yes. And there were people in church last week because of a simple invitation, a, a bringing culture. There's no stranger or no family member that is outside the reach of Jesus. And we have the opportunity to bring them to encounter our Savior, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. But we have to make this choice. Do people just stumble upon Greenville first, upon Jesus at times? They do. But I don't know about you. I look at my life before Jesus and I have a lot of regrets. What would have happened if I made the decision earlier to follow Jesus? How effective could my life have been in the younger years? I don't want to wait for other people just to stumble upon Jesus if I can be a part of bringing them to receive their miracle and transform their life before it's too late, before they waste their life away, before they look at me one day and say, Pastor, why didn't you tell me about this God? Why didn't you tell me about this Jesus? My perspective was so off and so skewed because I've been hurt. Or maybe I've seen hypocrites. Well, you know what? We're all a bunch of hypocrites. And the great thing about the crowd is when we gather as a crowd, we kind of lose that. I'm getting too ahead of my notes. Sorry. I'm going to get just reel it back in. These crowd sizes that Jesus was facing, they, they were pretty large. See, Capernaum uh, would have been about 1,500 people. Bethesda would have been about 3,000. Tiberias, 15,000. Magdala, 40,000. So when it says that the whole town gathered at the door of Jesus, this could have been 60,000 people gathering at at, at the door to see and hear what Jesus was teaching and doing. Crowds gather when Jesus is at the center. But see, this bringing, those crowds didn't just by accident. There were people saying, hey, have you heard about this Jesus? Have you heard of, have you seen the miracles yet? Have you heard about the miracles yet? Come with me. When we look into this root word of the, of the word, they brought people to Jesus. This actually means that they were a burden carrier. See, the 60,000 doesn't show up without people carrying the burden for their friends and their family. To look at the status of life that they're in and refuse to let them off the hook. There's an urgency that's tied to this burden. It's intensified here. Now, no matter what, I need people to experience Jesus. What would happen if we embraced this idea of being a bringer? Not just an inviter, but being a bringer. When somebody says, well, hey, I can't come this week. Well, great. How about next week? Well, I don't have a ride next week. Well, great. I'll come pick you up. Well, I work on Sunday mornings. Well, great. We have a once a month Sunday night and we have small groups on campus on Wednesday nights. Well, I I work on Wednesday nights. Well, great. We got Tuesday night small groups and Thursday night small groups. When there is a burden, there begins to be this intensity that takes place that we don't let people off with an excuse. I have a friend who was, was doing young adult ministry for a long time, and they would have no excuse nights. And they would bring in, seriously, and this may sound far-fetched for you, but they would bring in tutors. So if the excuse was, well, hey, I have to, I have to write a paper, I can't be there, well, great, we have tutors at church. So after or before, we can sit you down with a tutor and they'll help you finish this. Well, I'm tired. Well, great, we have a room that's set up for you to take a power nap before or after service. I mean, they had all of these, their goal was to remove excuse from church. What if we begin to do that with every excuse we get, every time we invite somebody to church, we find a way 
to connect with them and bring them to experience Jesus. See, Luke 9, 11 talks about how Jesus loved the crowd. But the crowds learned about it and followed him, and he welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed healing. Out of all the changes we've seen, and if you've been a part of this journey at Greenville First, you've seen a lot of changes take place in this building and on this campus. Out of all the changes we've made, my favorite is the fact that we are shifting to an external welcoming culture. Every person that's come and planted roots in the past six, eight months that we've been pastors here, everybody talks about the people of Greenville First. And how much of a family it feels like. And I just felt at home when I showed up. And people are loving me and they don't even know me. And it's so much fun to watch during our moment of fellowship. Because some of you that have been a part of Greenville First for such a long time, you like recognize, hey, I've never seen them before. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to beeline across the room and I'm going to make sure that they feel warm and welcomed and greeted. Why? Because that's the model of Jesus. He welcomed the crowds. When you pull on campus... There's a reason we have people in the parking lot welcoming you. And for some of you, it was a little rub that we have cones blocking sections off and people actually directing you which way to park. But don't think about what you've done for the past 10, 20 years. Think about what it would be like if you were the first time pulling on campus. We're not doing this for you. We're doing this for the crowds that are gathering, the people that God is calling into this house. There's a reason we want to have a welcoming culture. These cones that, this is in my notes, so I'm I'm not adding time to it. These cones that are in front. You know what? We want to have a welcoming culture. You know what? That section, I'm just going to educate the whole congregation. So you hear it from the pastor's mouth. And if you're not here, hopefully you'll tune online and catch this later. But the entire front section, if you're a young mom, if you're a young family, if you're a senior in the house, You know what accessible parking means? You need help and you need it easier to access the building. Sometimes we define spots by handicap signs and then all of us, uh, other people that don't need, we park in the, we're like, oh, handicap. There's too many handicap signs. Have you ever thought that at the mall? Like, well, if they clear a few of these handicap. But what about your grandparents? What about your friends who need access to the building? So we want to protect this. I, I saw, I, I don't know where Miss Carol Pruitt is. She's probably, I see you now. Last Sunday, I caught her walking, and I said, why are you walking? You're supposed to be parking out front. And she's like, well, I'm in good shape. I go to the gym. I'm good. <laughs> well, I said, well, just so you know, there are parking spaces that are reserved for you. You know where I park on Sunday mornings? Up on the hill. Why? Because we're trying to change the culture that we would be a welcoming house that when people come, there's a spot for them. When it's their first time on campus, they're being directed to the closest and most accessible parking. If you're, you've been a part of the house for 35, 40 years, we still got access for you because we want to be welcoming to those generations who have been here, are here, and those who are coming. And we want to change this culture. There's a reason there's a tent outside and we give water bottles and little goodie bags to our new guests who are coming on campus because we want to be welcoming. If we can't welcome the crowd, we'll never help people get from the crowd to the one. And it's our goal to draw closer to him. A few more just things on how we can be welcoming. I don't care how good of a friend, I'm just reading and I'm not making any eye contact. I don't care how good of a friend you are with the greeters or the ushers or the people at the welcome tent. Stop talking to them. Find somebody you need to talk to. And that's somebody who hasn't been here or looks lost. And every time we engage and monopolize conversations with people who are serving on mission to welcome people to this campus, we're detracting. Try this. Stay after for a few minutes after service and look for people you don't know. Instead of running. One of the things I love about Grandma Friday, I beat people to the restaurant. I'm like pulling out at 12 o'clock and there's still people here talking. I love it. But what if you took the same level of energy and you found people who it was their first time here today? And you started a relationship and you began to help them move from that outer circle to the inner circle. 
What would happen if we began to model this? See, crowds are a great place to start, but not a great place to stay. We don't want you just to come here to soothe your guilt. We want you to come here to find a Savior. That's our goal. I don't want church just to be the, well, I go to church, so I feel better on Sundays, and maybe by Monday, I, I've lost it all. But when you find a Savior, a Savior is, Jesus wants to walk with you on your day-to-day. He doesn't just want to soothe the guilt. He wants to journey with you in relationship. Now, I think that there's three quick points that we find in these crowds. So if you have your notes, we're actually getting to your notes right now, but I'm going to be quick this morning. And the number one thing that we learn from crowds is in the crowds we discover how much we need a shepherd. Matthew 9, 36, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. See, Jesus saw the challenges of the crowd that was gathered, and he still sees the challenges that face the crowd today. See, we have an enemy, all of us. We're harassed. I don't know about you, but there are days, this morning, I felt harassed. We walked in and the sound wasn't working. I'm like, last week, my mic's feeding back. This week, the speakers aren't turning on. Devil, get out of here. We have an enemy. If you don't think it's real, then you're not living life. Check your pulse. And Jesus saw that the people then were harassed, and he sees that we're harassed today. He also sees that we're, we're hopeless without him. We're helpless without him. We suffer from this lonely place of just being lost like sheep without a shepherd. Now, there's a few things that that we find in the characteristics of sheep that I think this this is just fun. Sheep have no sense of direction. No real sense of direction. They're quite helpless against predators. If they're left alone, they will actually eat themselves into a lost place. They're weak. They get dirty easily. They're social creatures that do better in numbers. They require more care than any other livestock. And they're easily panicked. I don't know about you, but that sounds like my life sometimes. (laughs) Sheep without a shepherd. We find in the crowds that we have a great need for a great shepherd. We may have no real sense of direction. That's very true in my life. Thank you the Lord for smartphones and navigation. But also in discovering the purpose for our life. We, can, we have no real sense of direction without our shepherd guiding us. We're helpless against predators. I love this one. When we're left alone, we'll actually eat ourselves into a lost place. You take that however you want to take it, okay? Church, we're nothing but sheep. There's a reason that Jesus, his perspective, he saw us as sheep. He sees us as sheep. And he labels himself as the great shepherd. And in the crowd, we discover this. By seeing and hearing what Jesus is saying, we can recognize that we have a great need for a great shepherd. The second thing we find in the crowds is we follow Christ to the places of watching and listening. Matthew 4, 23 through 25, Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness amongst the people. News about him spread all over Syria and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon possessed, those having seizures and the paralyzed and he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan, they followed him. See, in the crowds, we follow Christ to the places of watching and listening. There's something that most of us, because I know there are some introverts in the room, we love about crowds. And even as introvert, you probably still love some of these characteristics of crowds. Because our own identities can be removed. We don't have to be known 
by our name when it comes to a crowd. My son, he, he's a huge Gamecock fan because of his father's influence. And um, he already, he's like, Dad, I, when are we going to the Gamecock game? You know? And um, I'm like, got to wait till fall. You know? And then he looks at his brother and says, Jensen, when you get older, you can go meet Cocky too. You are a smart four-year-old because we are not taking your brother yet. He will be on the field somehow. Um, but there's something we love about crowds. My son has no idea what's happening on the field. But he loves his place in the stadium. Where you look around and everybody's yelling things that you would never yell anywhere else except in that stadium. Um, if you're from South Carolina, you get it. Uh, you just wouldn't do it. We get so passionate about it. My father-in-law, he's a Clemson fan. Every time his phone rings, I'm like... I didn't even realize phones have a volume like that, but it's, it's this awful chant from this other university, and it's, it's just crazy, but there's something. There's something we love about identifying with those crowds because our identity just evaporates. We lose ourselves in the crowd. We love our place in the crowd. But see, we're not called to just occupy a seat in a stadium. We're called to move closer. We're, we're called to move to this place of, of hearing and seeing. One of the highlights, I, I, I love sports, and one of the greatest moments it, of me being a sports fan was when uh, the, the, the Christian school that was a part of our church in Florida, they went to the public school state championship. And for four years, they, they, they had a solid, one of the guys, he just signed with the, the Pittsburgh Steelers uh, yesterday. We had, we had some athletes on that team. And I remember standing on the sideline two years in a row, we were in the state championship. And I remember there was no better seat in the house than being close to the action. It may would have been fun for some to be in the stands, but for me, I wanted to get as close. I wanted to be in the locker room and be around all these sweaty high school kids. Why? Because there are memories. There's something that happens when you're hearing the coach begin to give the instruction and he's talking about the game plan and talking about the adjustments that need to be made that you'll never catch if you're just occupying a seat in the stands. Something has to take place. We have to follow Christ to this place of watching and listening because the experience is so much better as our circle increases and draws closer. Watch, listen. And move closer. And we move closer by hearing and seeing the teachings of Jesus. And our final point this morning is that in the crowds, the commotion in our lives has to be cleared so we can hear the words of Jesus. See, in Matthew 9, we find this account and this man approaches Jesus. And if you're familiar with this passage, he comes to Jesus and he says, My daughter has just died. I need you to to come and lay your hands on her and she'll live. See, we find a few things that he does. He brings his pain to Jesus by saying, my daughter has just died. He brings his plea to Jesus. Will you please come and lay your hands? And then he brings his profession of faith to Jesus because when you lay your hands on her, she'll be made well. But something interesting happens In verse 23, and Pastor Zach, you can come on as we land the plane today. In verse 23, when Jesus entered the synagogue leader's house and saw the noisy crowd and people playing pipes, they were actually, they had began to mourn the death of this girl. We pick up in verse 24 because Jesus gets some, some crazy instructions here. Go away. The girl is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. And after the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand, and she got up. Jesus had to clear the commotion for the miracle to take place. See, I think for some of us, we find ourselves in the commotion of the crowd. There's so much commotion in our life. There's so much commotion in our relationships. There's so much commotion just in our day-to-day, our workplace. That we're not seeing the miracle of Jesus because we're just caught up in the commotion. You know what the commotion is? 
The commotion is when we have a situation in our life and we go to all of our friends before we go to our Savior. We have a work situation that we hate and we're just so desperate to get out of. And so what do we do? We send 1,500 resumes to all these jobs before we spend one moment in the presence of Jesus to say, what would you have me to do? Church, there's a lot of times in our life that we, we just get caught up in the commotion. We got family issues and we want to talk to other family members and and gain sides and position before we just take it to Jesus and say, Jesus, I'm bringing you my pain. I'm bringing you my plea. And I know that you are faithful enough that I'm going to exercise faith and I'm going to believe for the miracle. And the commotion will cease and the miracle will take place. See, even in the crowds, miracles happen. Jesus doesn't want us to stay there. He wants us to move closer. But for a lot of us, we've got to get rid of the commotion to get there. See, if you want to move closer to Jesus, you've got to remove some of the commotion in your life. Taking this place of trust, listening and watching, recognizing we need a shepherd because we're just wandering lost sheep. And we need to watch and and learn from Jesus. And we need to clear the commotion in our lives so that we can receive the miracle. See, I don't know where you are in your life today. Maybe you're in the crowd. Maybe you're sitting in your house and you've ignored the invitation of the crowd and you just stumbled upon here today, regardless of where you are. Maybe maybe you're in one of the deeper circles and the challenge today is that you would actually start bringing people to be a part of the crowd. That you'd, you'd embody this idea and the spirit of being a bringer, being a welcomer. And maybe today you just need to be reminded that it's okay to start in the crowd. It's not okay to stay there. Let's journey together. If you find yourselves in the crowd, you know where you need to find yourselves on Wednesday at 7 is in our Fresh Start class. Why? Because we're seeing... What a wonderful like conversation and small group we had on Wednesday night is we're taking people and saying, hey, we're going to lay a healthy foundation in our faith. We talked about our perspective of God on Wednesday night. How many of us, we've just never, ever, and, and one of the, the people in the class said, Pastor, I've, I've been in church a long time and I've never laid this foundation. What a wonderful testimony to say, hey, We can be in the crowd, but let's not stay there. But maybe you find yourself here today and you've been searching, you've been wandering, you've been questioning, is Jesus real? Is this thing, what what could Jesus really have to do with my life, with where I am, with all my pain, with all my hurt, with all my brokenness? If he can raise a dead girl to breathe again, he can rescue you from wherever you are. And I just want every head to be bowed, every eye to be closed this morning. This is a sensitive time. And if you're here today and you just say, Pastor, I need to make that decision to follow Jesus. I know I may be making a step into the crowd, but I'm going to take a step today and I'm going to begin a relationship with him. Will you do me a favor? Nobody's looking. Will you just slip your hand up? Yeah. See those hands. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you making a decision today to follow Jesus. See that hand. Thank you. See that hand. Thank you so much. Anybody else? Praise God. Can we just repeat this simple prayer after me? Thank you, Jesus, for giving me life, for giving your life for me. I receive you as my Savior. Please forgive my mistakes. Please help me become clean. Help me to love you. Help me to draw close to you. Help me to love others. Help me to live wisely. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we give it up for those who made that decision?